Get ready to rock. Welcome to our GRTR at 20 podcast series. And now an interview with Chris Uzi, one time with the bands Virginia Wolf and Heartland, and more recently with Snake Charmer and Kingdom of Madness. We spoke with Chris back in November 2011. So how did uh, Heartland develop then? The first band I was ever in, basically, I ever started singing in was uh, a band called Monroe, and, they, and the guitarist from that band was a guy called uh, Gary Sharp. Um, so he'd been a friend since I was, I guess, 15 or something. Um, and I just went, I just kind of met up with him again, almost out of the blue. Um, I wanted to do some demoing of stuff that I had, and he had his own home studio. So the two things kind of just, we kind of drifted back together, if you like. Uh, and that uh, culminated in the debut Harlan record with A&M in 1990, I suppose it was, uh, produced by uh, Jim Barton. And the whole thing kind of just went on from there, really. So were there, were there great sort of aspirations for the band? Because you, you received quite a big push, didn't you? I seem to remember at the time. a and records were ex- extremely keen on the band um, right from the beginning. We were really lucky to get the right kind of, the right record company behind us and the right amount of backing. Um, and when Jim Barton came in to produce the record, I mean, it, it, it was almost like an open, and it, it seems ridiculous in this day and age, but it was almost like an open wallet. It was, you know, whatever you want to do with this band to record them, it's okay with us, you know. Um, and that just doesn't happen anymore. It just doesn't happen anymore. We were so lucky with that one. Um, but it was a little bit of all eggs in one basket kind of thing. Um, quite a big budget went into the recording of that record, and there was always the feeling that it was it was going to be all or nothing. You know, that album was either going to was going to rock it or it wasn't, and uh, it was no real surprise to us um, when A and M didn't want to go forward with a, with uh, a second album after the first album um, didn't really get. At the time, uh, and I just a, a big enough sales, to be honest with you. Um, but it seems strange now looking back because that album now has kind of grown in people's minds, uh, in people's minds, and it's become to some people a bit of a classic uh, of that sort of a genre. But uh, but at the time it was it was you know rock music was very difficult to sell as it as it can be now. Yeah. I mean, of course, you'll remember as well around that time. I mean, you had bands like Dare, didn't you, from the UK? Um, and no end of bands from the States. And, of course, then Grunge kicked in and everybody hit the decks, really, didn't they? It was um, it was just bad timing. But, yeah, I do remember the... Um, certainly had some rather impressive-looking... Um, certainly the 12-inch singles, because that, that was the era, wasn't it, for packaging, really? Yeah, and they did a good job with it, there's no doubt about it. I've got no complaints um, with the way that we were handled by A&M at, at that time. They had a lot of belief in the band. Now, what happened, Chris, after Heartland? I mean, you evidently got into session work, but um, and, and we should say, of course, we'll come on to talk about the albums you made in the sort of mid to late 1990s and beyond for Escape Music. And in different guises, they were really Heartland albums. In fact, they were called Heartland. But what what was happening in the immediate aftermath of Heartland in the early 90s? Yeah, there was a period. I mean, it was quite a low period for me. I think whenever you've uh, whenever you've had that kind of support from a major company, um, and it goes down, um, there's a period of kind of having to dust yourself off, and you're wondering what the heck you're going to do next, and and that can be a difficult period, and it was a difficult period. Um, I even considered it, uh, at various stages in turning my back on it. Um, I'm so I'm obviously, I'm glad I didn't. Um, so, yeah, there was a pretty dark period of, a, of probably a couple of years where I was... Um, Escape Music came forward and wanted to release some demos that we'd written for a, a possible second um, Heartland record which came out as uh, wide open on, I think, Long Island Records and then around 94 on Escape Music. So uh, they came forward, and, and in a way, that kind of... Uh, the fact that, all right, there were only a small record company, especially in those days, but there was, again, a lot of faith in what I'd done in the past, and 
And when people kind of approach you and they have your best interests at heart like that, it kind of makes you think, well, you know what, if other people are prepared to make the effort, then I should be prepared to make the effort. Now, most recently, uh, coming more up to date, you've hooked up with what was called Monsters of Rock with Mickey Moody and uh, Neil Murray, ex of um, you know the early formation of Whitesnake. And this seems to have morphed now into the band called Snake Charmer. Uh, I should mention that you've got a support slot with Uriah Heep in December. We're talking now in uh, November 2011. And um, you have a, a showcase in London at the Dean Street Studios. It's an invite only um, to launch the band, I presume. And I, I gather you've also got new material. Yeah, it's been really good. It's, uh, it's gone quite quickly. In 2000 and well, last year, um, we signed up with a new management company. Uh, QED, Q Management. Um, didn't do, we haven't done many gigs this year. It's all been about um, writing and recording. We've got two new tracks now ready to go. They've just been mixed, finished yesterday. Uh, we've recorded a couple of the old classic tracks. I mean, more as a way of um, of getting some interest for gigs next year. So we're we're hoping to do a lot more gigs next year. But we're look, now kind of tentatively looking towards. Um, writing and releasing an album I hope next year certainly makes it more relevant does it you know for audiences because it's um, there's always a bit of a reaction isn't there to something like this as like a I mean it's a very good tribute obviously because you've got people who played in original bands but it's only when that new material comes through that people really take notice don't they you know absolutely I, yeah. absolutely. I mean it, it was never meant really to be a, a tribute kind of band obviously as two of the members the original members of White Snake, and uh, the majority of the uh, of the songs that were playing live uh, were, were co-written by uh, Mickey Moody. So it, I think it's relevant in that in, to, to that extent. But uh, I guess until you introduce live music into it, it doesn't become a band in its own right. No, that's right. Now, now h- how did you get involved in the first place with... I, I remember Monsters of Rock, you did a gig in um, at the Cambridge Rock Festival, I think you mentioned 2010... That may well have been one of your first gigs, actually, but, um, you know, certainly a, a big gig. But um, how, you know, before that, how did you all get together? Um, well, I think there'd been other bands um, around the same sort of uh, sort of idea beforehand that I wasn't particularly aware of uh, with Mickey and Neil. Because um, we should mention there, um, just to cut you off a little bit, Chris, um, M3, that was going around about 2004, 2005, yeah, I was kind of vaguely aware that I, I hadn't met Nicky or Neil at the time. Um, I just got a phone call um, from an old mate of mine who used to be in the first band that I was ever in, a guy called Pete Dutton, who now does the uh, out front sound um, for the band, and has his own production company. And uh, he, he said that my name had come up when they were looking for, uh, to put a band together, um, and that they'd be interested in having me come down to a, a rehearsal. So I went down to John Henry's rehearsal rooms in London about January 2010 and met up with the rest of the guys, Harry, Harry James, great drummer on the Thunder, uh, Laurie Weisfield, uh, obviously Nick, uh, Neil and Mickey and um, and it just gelled, the whole thing just gelled and it was fun, you know, I mean, having spent a lot of time over the years writing and recording more than really playing live and I've, I've not played live enough for me, for my go at once. Um, so it was just a lot of fun to get in a rehearsal room with musicians of that sort of standard, of that caliber, and uh, but but not take it over seriously, you know, do it for the fun of doing it. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I, I knew pretty much immediately from that rehearsal that uh, that the band could go out and and have a lot of fun playing classic songs that uh, that are relevant to to the band. Um, what's been the reaction to some of those, to, to, you know, from the audience really hearing some of those classic tracks again? I mean, that represents quite a challenge for you as a vocalist because, at least at the moment, you've been um, there's a fair bit of White Snake in the set list. H- how did you approach that, Chris? You know, in terms of interpretation. Strangely, I think other people worry about that more than I do. I think at the end of the day, when I when I ever I step up to the mic to sing any song. I'm not, I mean, obviously, if it's someone else's material, I'm aware of the past that that song has. But when I step up to the mic, I'm basically thinking, how do I get the best out of this song with my voice? 
how do I interpret the lyrics and how do I, you know what I mean? I, I, it's all about trying to get the best out of a good song, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it, although I, it'd be silly to say that I'm not aware that people in the audience are waiting, probably, you know, white big fans of old and are waiting for me to open my, open my mouth in, on the first line. But once you once you step up to the mic, you're thinking about the song. You're not thinking about people's expectations. I think if you were, the job would be made 50 times more difficult. So for me, it's about walking to the mic or re when I'm recording, it's about just getting the best out of the song that I can possibly get with my voice rather than trying uh, you know, to, to come up to someone else's expectations, to be honest. I think what you're saying really is be, being yourself, isn't it? Because it, it's too easy probably to... Um to try and emulate others, and uh, that wouldn't be natural, would it? You know, not at all. I mean, if, no. if I go back to you know when I was in my late teens, perhaps that sort of period of time, Coverdale was a, um, a really big influence on me as a vocalist. I had, I guess, like a holy trinity of, of vocalists: Paul Rogers, Ian Gillan, Coverdale, and, and and they were really important to kind of the way that I developed as a singer. But once you get sort of beyond your your twenties and you or your mid twenties. You're listening to music less because you're playing more and you're writing more and you develop your own style. Yes. And uh, you, you mentioned influences. You mentioned Whitesnake. Now, that would have probably coincided with um, some classic Whitesnake of that period. So uh, who else were you listening to at that time, you know, when you were first getting into music, really, on a more serious level? Well, I, I, like a lot of uh, a lot of musicians, I, I was kind of influenced by an older, an, an older sibling. I had an older brother. It was bringing records into the house when I was, I don't know, 13, 14. Uh, and a lot of those records were kind of, certainly on the rock side of things, I was getting, I was listening to a lot of Deep Purple by the time I was 14, 15. Um, I, I, I loved Free, uh, Free Bad Company, those kind of bands. But also lots of other, lots of other stuff, lots of other different influences. There's a couple of the albums from the Tudes that I was, absolutely head over heels with at the time a heck of a lot of stuff black sabbath a lot of the usual suspects really but uh judith priest a lot and mostly obviously selfishly listening to it as a vocalist so a lot of the uh, a lot of the bands that i listened to obviously i was attracted to them because of some great strong vocalists yes did you mention the tubes there yeah, there's a, there's a couple of albums that I really, that I really like. Um, again, just strong vocals, strong melodic vocals, uh, but with attitude. I mean, the, the, the studio stuff was, to me, it was just, it was crafted so well. 